one of those things. I, my buddy Mark Showman was teaching there, so he needed to take a leave of absence, and they passed it, uh, the baton to me, and there I was. Fantastic. Yeah. So you so you you started teaching where Freddie was teaching. Absolutely, yeah. It's, and it's weird because I didn't really know Freddie taught there because his, you know, in my early formative studies with him, you you, you didn't know where he was, where you know, and he he had a very peculiar way of of you know running his uh what do i want to say his, running your head how's that not running his head running uh -huh. your head. so uh he he only intimated certain things at certain times and if you pressed him for information there was a lot of vagaries to that so so you had so you had to have your own curiosity you had to bring it into the room with you yeah you know i was i was rather a reserved kid i was just awestruck with the uh technical approach that he had because at that back in that specific period of time um because i know because i was there for many many years to just observe that particular time period was probably the most golden of his teaching mm. uh, and he was very comprehensive and then i would say maybe around the early 80s before he sold his house Things started to shift and change, and by the time he sold that little house on Etiwanda, which would have been around 1984, then the context of how he taught really started to change and morph into stuff, and the details that he had were not as present and accounted for in all the teaching. It depended on the guy, but... Um, and uh, why that is, I don't know. I never asked him because his relationship with me was quite different. So we basically, I could, I could infiltrate and get information. I, like I said to you yesterday, I was on probably the most, you know, you'd have layers of uh, inner circle with Freddie. I was on the innest most circle of hanging with him as I did. I'm the only guy that I know of and other than him doing cameo clinics with Dave Weckl or Steve Smith, whereby I did clinics with him. And, you know, uh, my role was to maybe demonstrate a few things and maybe speak for a minute about Freddie and my history with him. But, um, and I have one, one document on DVD that is actually a reasonably good one because Freddie was notorious to get wildly off topic and be quite cryptic in his <laughs> clinic presentation. Yeah. And if I look back, I would say that my, you know, my assessment of that is that there may have been a performance anxiety or something like that. I mean, because he was very, you know, when you had him in a one-on-one -on -one setting, there was clarity uh, that you could, and I say clarity loosely because you had to really dig and pick sometimes. And mm. like I said, because I lived with him and did so many other things away from the teaching thing, I was able to always bring him back to a place and go like, hey, what about this? And get, you know, some uh, deeper... Um, what do you want to say? Narrative to what was happening. That's that's terrific, you know. And I want to do that. But before we do that, yeah, uh, I I want to know. I mean, how did you? I want to know about when you first met him. How that? What was that? What was that about? Yeah. I mean, did you know who he was before you yeah. met him? Did, so how so, did you find out about him? Well, I'll give you my stock story. That's the story. So when my when I was no 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 don't give me the stock story. Give me the real story. No, no, okay. real story. I mean. <laughs> I have a vivid uh, memory for everything, so it's always okay. Detail. But so my mom and dad in the '70s were really into uh, the dog show circuit. They were showing our uh, Alaskan Malamute uh, bitch, who was the number one winning Malamute, and I think the number one winning champion for two years. It was ridiculous. So uh, the reason I bring that up is because there was a photographer on scene all the time to do photo shoots in the Southern California area. And his name was Eddie Rubin. And Eddie was one of the early drummers with Neil Diamond, hearkening back to Sweet Caroline. <laughs> and he had studied with Freddie. I remember, yeah. And my, my mom was always, you know, uh, talking about her sons, because my brother David at that time was playing trumpet, but later on moved to guitar. And uh, she would say, yeah, my son's a drummer. And Eddie would say, oh, you got to study with Freddie Gruber. So there's, there's one connection. And my mom would say, you got to study with this guy, Freddie Gruber. And then another guy, my friend Mark Shulman, had known about Freddie as well, but he found a student of Freddie's and said, ah, don't worry about Freddie, study with this guy, Rich Sandak. And so I studied a little bit with Rich, maybe for about <coughs> four months, I think. And, uh, in, 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 but in, I got to uh, remember one point, before I started studying with Rich, I did call Freddie up. 
And because he was so cantankerous on the phone, he would run you through a myriad of questions. How old are you? I don't know. You're 18? I don't know. I don't really teach guys that young. And, and uh, <laughs> well, I'm trying to book next week. Why don't you call me the week after? And what I think he was doing was just doing a, you know, a, a protocol of, are you really going to call me and come out? You know, so at that point in time, I was a, uh, let's say, a vociferous young man who would speak his mind. And I got kind of irritated and said, all right, if you don't have time, I'll, I'll you know, I'll call you some other time. Bingo. Hang on. I don't, I don't blame you. <laughs> so I hung with, with Rich for a minute. And then uh, I called Freddie back up. And my brother tells me this because this is the one part I didn't remember. But when I picked up the phone and got Freddie on the phone, I said, yeah, man, I'm ready. You know, so. <laughs> so that was how I met him. Uh, the other guy that is interesting because I found out later that Mel had a lot of disdain for Freddie. That's Mel Zelnick who ran the Music Stop, and, and Freddie actually worked for Mel as a teacher when Mel owned the Music Stop with a partnership with Terry Gibbs, the great vibist. Interesting. Yeah. And um, Mel would say in his very deep, gravelly voice, smoking those vantage cigarettes, going, Bruce. If you really want to learn to play the drums, you got to go to Freddie Gruber. <laughs> and and later on, when I found out, you know that that Mel would would just get irritated at Freddie's antics, I thought, wow, respect runs deep, you know. <laughs> so, whether Freddie was a character or not, Mel kind of knew that he had something going on. So well, that's what counts, you know. Yeah, yeah. that's the bottom line. And so once I once I got the first lesson, I was already one of these guys that was. Uh, a technically inclined kid and what I mean to say is yes drumming but also that personality trait ran into my uh, love for the game of baseball and uh, carefully studying and watching how batters would bat Ooh. carefully studying how pitchers would pitch watching oh. mechanics that I would draw from oh great man I love this the same thing with skiing. I was a competitive skier when I was a young boy, like oh. around 12, 13. And then my dad was was cool enough to catch the, the skiing bug as well. And when uh, I was about 13 or 14, he bought a condominium. Actually, I don't say he bought it. He invested my brother David's money with his commercial money because my brother David was into uh, doing a, a several... Uh, commercial ads for some of the you know big products like Mattel, Kellogg's, mm. uh, McDonald's, wow. and, wow. and so uh, every year we would spend you know at least the Christmas holidays, maybe the Easter holidays, some several weekends, and go skiing. And so I was always fixated on my <clears throat> approach to skiing bumps and stuff like that. And I had a friend that was the same age as me who was about the same level of skiing, and we would just constantly push ourselves and compete, you know, kind of competitively in that regards. But when I was a kid, when I first started to ski, I learned in Austria, so I had a really great teacher, and I uh, uh, raced a little bit. And uh, actually, in one race, I won the golden ski in my category, so. Wow. But uh, so, anyway, so because of all that technical kind of headspace, I found myself quite enamored with the early uh, like I said, the, those particular points in time of Freddie and how he set things up. You know, he had a very comprehensive thing. And so, you know, in terms of that was my background. That was like the, the, um, the setting that allowed me to use my imagination to take those things to build in what I do as a teacher. So you were, you were in touch with your body even before you started. Him. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I, I, you know, yeah, if you want to state it like that, I would say, yeah, to, to a great degree, I was always thinking about that kind of stuff. You know, when I, before I started studying with Freddie, I was already fixated on, you know, sitting with single strokes and working on playing with my left hand for a bar of 16th notes in my right hand. And so uh, you, you were the ideal student and he was the ideal teacher. Uh, yeah, I guess it was the perfect kismet. Yeah, because the teachers that I had before, well, actually, you know, my very first teacher happened and turned out to be a former student of Freddie's, who was uh -huh. actually the partner of the uh, infamous or the famous Ross Garfield out here in Los Angeles, the drum doctor. Hmm. And Ross worked with this guy, Bill James. Bill was my teacher. And he was, uh, uh, at that point, he made house calls. He used to drive out in his Volkswagen van and come to my house and... Uh my parents made me a deal. They said, look, if you study drums for one year on the practice pad and show us you're serious, then we'll get you a drum kit. Uh, my first teacher came to my house, too. 
Yeah. Yeah, three dollars a lesson. <laughs> I was four, uh, something like that. Oh, you had a high class teacher. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, this is great. I love this stuff. So uh, I guess we should. You should start to show us what Freddie, what you got from him. Well, yeah. you know, so you know, as as far as like you know, what did I get from him? A lot of different things. It's it's so. I have to sort of really start to just tap into that. Um, well, well I'm talking. sure you have it organized. Yeah. You know, so absolutely. just I'm gonna I'm gonna get out of your way at this point and, and, and let you go. There's context of you know, and these things are are not secrets necessarily. The one thing that I'll say, and it's hard to separate because you know a lot of teachers and a lot of people would speak freely about you got to understand the balance of the stick and you got to work with the stick and you don't want to use a lot of tension and blah blah blah. That being said. Um, that is all in theory. What I do is also very much in the context of building and changing and reshaping your reflexes, also related to, if you want to call it neuro-linguistic programming, but how you perceive that information to shift and change. Because if you tell somebody, hey man, loosen up, they may accept that. But that may not internally be something where they can actually do that. And so, I'll speak about some of the later Freddy, because I start there for a myriad of reasons. But I'm looking at, and I'll just start here, I'm looking at building the arc of technique. So in other words, being able to shift through whatever you want to call the French grip. But there are very specific uh, positionings that I work with to reframe reflexes and to build up a certain character and sensibility of relationship of hand and stick and that into later on German and then if you want to you know kinda morph into what Dom uh, titles the American grip absolutely because everything is game in this instrument if you're talking old-school approaches like the Murray Spivak and you're talking about just playing vertically on the pad that only has practical application to the pad, whereby we are not playing on a pad, we are playing on the drum set. And you want to be able to work in the context with how that instrument is set up. So you've got your ride cymbal, you've got your crash cymbal, whatever voicings of toms you want to have. I'm an old school guy, so I kind of reduced everything back to four piece set many years ago. And uh, I always say, if it's good enough for Ringo, it's good enough for me. So. Uh, so, setups. French grip. I've seen many presentations of French grip, and so what, what I think some finer points and details are is the setup of your embouchure, your arm positioning related to how you're housing the stick. And again, these are not for necessary for direct playing experience. It's for reframing things. And what we want to do is, again, work on the balance of the stick in the last joint of the index finger. So right there in that little cup, let that stick sit there nicely, man. Let it feel balanced. Feel that. You can actually get anybody to experience that. That's a very easy place to start. And then the reflexive part, the hard part, and some people look at this going, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Believe me, I've had a lot of guys. I've been teaching for 34 years. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah is not necessarily yes. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. The fingers need to be contoured to support the squeeze or the snap of the stick into the, to the fingers, to the bed of the back three fingers, to, to work on that reflex. Because if you go into cradle mode and you just pull the stick in, you're negating any of the balance principles that you're looking to uh, modify in your play. So you get a squeeze and a release. And again, if I look at my elbow to my side to my armpit, I have an isosceles triangle. So you're looking for positioning. Why? Because in the French grip, it's tympanous grip. So you're looking to motivate the tympani mallet from the forearm, the radius ulna. And if you do a roll in tympani, you don't really go into hyperspace singles because you'll cancel out the notes on the tympani. You're looking for just a variable of roll. And so that's one of the key things to look at to advance that understanding of this part of our anatomy. and you know, work in the confines of those things. Again, uh, when you get into playing mode and you're playing time, let's say you're playing the jazz ride cymbal rhythm, 
certain protocol of move that you're looking for. Now you're not going to really be accessing that twist and turn so much. You're looking at the dynamic of the upstroke and the follow through and access accessing the hinge in your elbow, allowing the stick to swing freely. So you can work from the starting point of going, okay, wait a minute. I get at least some format of how to play that pattern as opposed to Now, I'll go back to a statement that I didn't make yet, that I always make with my students, is once you truly know the rules and regulations, you can always break them for posture and gesture, for attitude, for dialect, to creep into what it is you want to state, how it is you hear things, as long as you don't corrupt the foundation. If the foundation is truly built up, you can do it of many different ways and always come back to, ha, huh, huh, relax, huh, easy. So this particular pattern, if I take this follow through, it's not arbitrary, it's a note. It's the middle beat of triplet one and three. <laughs> so you can actually get the stick now just a swing. So what do you want to do with that? You want to be able to at least conduct a level of discipline whereby you can allow that movement to have its own orbit and not be disrupted by this, this, or this, whatever you're doing in comping exercise. So I have very detailed approaches. I have layers to build up. It's not rocket science, but it's thought through. So that's what I've been doing for many years. So everything I do is built off many different little starting points. So I have a workbench over here that I'll start with. I have a workbench over here, a workbench over here, maybe six or seven workbenches. And eventually, two of those workbenches kind of come together and merge. And we take it from there and build. And maybe that even splinters off to another augmented workbench to get a little detail in line with what we're looking to develop. So, and uh, so you know, that would be some of the sensibilities of French grip. Also, to find the bottom of the stroke so that you get a nice impact. Now, you don't always need that impact. So, again, reflexes are built up to support whatever the dynamic of what it is you're doing. So, okay, that's pretty vague. It means whatever tempo you're playing, whatever rhythmic phrase you're playing, you're going to be uh, uh, sort of tapping into different things of movement, of reflex, of bottoming out when you need to, or not. If I play a single paradiddle at this tempo in French grip, I don't want to try to stop the stick on the downstroke. There's too much momentum going on. That would disrupt the whole momentum. That's a physics principle. So you don't want to disrupt that. Uh, so, you know, those are some of the characteristics I do for French grip. Again, they're great for singles. They're not good for speed. They're not good for, our French grip is not the, the uh, advantage for rudimental playing. That really goes into German, which is a whole different sensibility in terms of the reframing of the reflexes. The physics principles remain the same. If you don't have the stick balanced and you don't understand the idea of letting go, and what I always say, this is my patented Bruce Becker phrase, that it is counterintuitive for drummers to let go. It's against their natural principles. Everybody wants to play everybody every note and get all over it, as opposed to allowing the freedom of the stick and learning how to conduct some sense of control with that stick so it works for you based on what you hear musically. You can't play what you don't hear. That's right. Right? That's right. So... Uh, any questions? I don't want to like be uh, like on a monologue here. So throw some feedback to me, Alan. Well, to be uh, all right. There's nothing in the t in the chat. Okay. I mean, uh, um, they're they're either busily writing notes or stunned. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I have some observations I can make. Uh, I really like when you tap the stick on the upstroke on the middle of the triplet. Mm-hmm. That, 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 that I think is brilliant to show, but you don't hear that, you know, because time and space are the same. That's right. So the fact that you, you delineated the space of the note that's not played is just as important as the note, that the space of the note that you do play. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and that is a brilliant concept. I got goosebumps from that yeah. one. Oh, thank you. Well, that, you know, again, that was, you know, the thing that, that Freddie Gruber was very key on when I was studying with him, and I say those, really those early formative years were, I mean, the breakdowns were so comprehensive 
to understanding the dynamic of movement. So what I, how I uh, frame it now is I just call it, it's the choreographing of your movement, being very cognizant of your choreographed movement. That's to say that you start there. Again, not everything is just this one size and you can only do this and there's no breathing room. It's just you need starting points to access movement to create the element of body time or time in movement of how we move. I mean, dancers do choreography to fit what they're doing for movement. So it's the, it's the same thing. Yeah. So it's why really, would, why wouldn't we? We're so relent. We are music. It's yeah. the same thing. So. I was a, I was a dance drummer on Broadway. I worked with yeah. all, all of the major choreographers of the day. Yeah. So I, I work. I watch them work with dancers. I watch them create the movements. I mean, it's uh, really the same. I work with tap dancers. Right. Uh, right. You know, it's it's over. It's so related. That's what we're doing. We're doing a dance. It's basically tap dancing as well. I mean, if you look at yeah. it, you got you got that element of the downstroke and the upstroke built in, and you can actually create some. I, I have a whole section of 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 uh, as in the building process that taps into the understanding and the dynamic of that tap dance mentality and understanding the dynamic of the upstroke and downstroke, whereby you get density out of your upstroke, and it's not just a passing afterthought to get to the downstroke, but it's utilized in the context of where's double paradiddle and triplets. I, I do this a lot in many presentations, but it's an easy one to share and to show that if you play down, up, down, up, I'm in triplets, double paradiddle, and I can get a nice fat upstroke and also learn to maintain some semblance of order in my drop to the pad so gravity doesn't sucker punch me into having to always come down with brunt, blunt force. I can actually, here's my downstroke, and now I can add a down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, and use that to advance some sense of the swinging of the stick. So swing as an entity or as a concept does not necessarily have to be tapped into the jazz idiom or that idea of music, That's right. That's right. but it can certainly be a, a viable yeah. asset to everybody's rock and roll playing. And just look at some of our forefathers of rock and roll, and I'll just go to my favorite period. That would be guys like Bonham and Mitch Mitchell and John Densmore or Ian Pace. And those guys already had that because of that lineage. They were closely up to all the hip stuff that was going on. They were probably listening to all the Coltrane, all the Miles, all the whatever was hip, they were checking out, man. You know, you hear it in <clears throat> Bonham's play because in his early solos of Moby Dick, what's his theme of the solo? It's the drum also waltzes. It's Max Roach. What's his theme theme lick for Bonham? Fuddlia. What is Max Roach? Fuddlia, you know? <laughs> so you know that, so those guys already were tapped into that that idea. Whether they chose to play rock and roll, that was a different thing. But that was the that was the happenings at the time. You know. That well, was I, I would take it a step further, Bruce. I mean, if you go back even further in our history, the guys who the or the rock and roll records that were made right before that. Oh yeah, those were jazz guys. Yeah, they're, they're all jazz guys to begin with. Of course, of course. So the rock and roll was injected with the jazz groove or, right, or right. feel to begin with. Mm -hmm. And the guys that understood that were the ones that were successful following them. And so I'm sure everybody in this forum that would be listening would say, well, we all know who Daniel Glass is. Daniel's put together his history of the, you know, the R&B guys, the ten commandments of R&B drumming or whatever, whatever that is, I don't remember. But uh, uh, Daniel you, did a lot you, of great uh, investigation uh, and interviewed a lot of guys. Yeah, oh uh, yeah, a hundred years of drum history or something. I think it was a century of a century of drumming. And if I might add to the to the uh, information, if people don't know, Daniel was my student for about three about three years. Sometimes in the early ninety nine, two thousand, two thousand one, he made an appearance. But he got serious with me about two thousand seven till two thousand ten, right before he moved to New York. And he got a lot of uh, you know, I guess more clarity as to what he thought he was doing with Freddie Gruber back then because he didn't really know he was very kind of like ah, what was that what was that and I said listen I don't know what Freddie exactly was trying to portray and put out in the 90s although I did but a lot of it was he was traveling a lot so he didn't get the steam you know 
one of the things that's very important and in my teaching practice for many years now is that connectivity, that consistent interaction with students. So, you know, I would just say if I look back to the last 20 years, because I, since I moved back to L.A. in 97 from living over in Europe, my average range of keeping students in that higher 90 percentile range is about three years, maybe four years, three to three and a half, something like that. So, and that's where you truly get the opportunity to build and shape and put things in order so that it is rooted and it's for me, it's a project. It's nothing that I take lightly. It's nothing that I'm like, uh, okay. I don't take students just to take them. If somebody wants to do a one-off, I'll engage them in that, but I'll always tell them, if you really want to get your stuff together, it's really about that consistent, um, interaction so that I can put all the nuts and bolts together and I'm about organizing and putting that together to push everybody over the fence not into the fence <laughs> I totally agree with you yeah yeah absolutely now um, yeah, da Daniel and I have uh, gotten pretty friendly yeah actually. I, w I went to see him last night at the uh, drummers collective right right oh, no I'm sorry it wasn't last night it was Friday night today's Sunday Oh. Uh, I'm losing my sense of time, and uh, I'm, I'm going to go back and see him. I, I, I sort of played with his trio, and that was fantastic, but I want to go back and look at some of his class on Monday. Very good. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've, so, been, I've been blessed. I've had a lot of guys. I, I, uh, I uh, consulted with Jojo Mayer because I introduced him to Freddie. I met him in 1994. I was uh, the head of a drum department at a defunct school now. It was similar to a Musicians Institute, a very smaller version, but it was in Vienna, Austria, and I was the head of that department for a year. Mm. And so I met Jojo and became friends with him. And um, at that time, he was actively interested in hearing about what Freddie Gruber was about, so I introduced him, and he went through the, you know, the whatever the firing range with Freddie to try to pin him down for a lesson he said the first time he just chased him around New York City never got anything and the second <laughs> a lesson he did get what he was looking for was some of the presentation <clears throat> bass drum technique mm -hmm. uh, which of course he was struggling with and he would call me regularly back in the early 2000s yeah man I don't know what that was and you know this is pre Skype so I would tell him hey man <laughs> You're not here. I can't tell you anything. <laughs> if we get the room together, I'll certainly give right. you a breakdown of sure. all the nuts and bolts that would be, you know, things that I would think would be an advantage to free up and add development to your foot. And uh, we did that in 2004, you know. But other guys who came to me were David Garibaldi. Uh, Mark Shulman's been a longtime on and off student. Uh, I had Ralph Johnson out now from Earth, Wind and Fire. Jiro Yamaguchi from Ozomotli, and then many other guys that are out working. Some, some guys out in New York, Jamie Evelyn, who's been doing a little bit of Broadway stuff and jazz stuff. And his mother is uh, the great writer Robert Flans, if you remember that name from Modern Drummer. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a, uh, a question in the chat box. Yes. I don't know if you're, if you're in there or not, but I'll read it for yeah. everybody who's watching. Anyway, this is Carlos. What's Carlos's last name? Carlos Perez. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, is there some kind of reference with the length of the stick? I've made some experiments between different length sticks, dividing the stick into three to grip, but the response are not the same, and I feel the longest ones accept the rebound better, higher and quicker. Everything. Just testing, let them fall with uh, the uh, natural force, I guess he means. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, you know, length of stick, that's a personal issue. The balance of the stick is always going to be what it is to whatever length of the stick is. Um, I don't really, you know, I play generally, my stick of choice is a um, the SD10 by Vic Firth or a 55A. Uh, what I like about the Firth is they are very contoured and, and they don't have a rapid drop off like some other sticks. Um, but just to, just to nail one thing into place, that once you establish the balance of the stick and you're in this position of being able to play from your French grip 
meandering into German in that arc of that technical approach. My stick rests comfortably whereby the flag, which would be the balance point, is resting between my middle finger and my thumb and index finger so that therefore the balance is rooted here. If I'm in French grip for fine-tuning the balance, I'll say sit over the flag. If I were in German and developing the sensibility of balance over the middle finger, the same thing. But once you build up the understanding of that, now you have, you have to build it into a workable positioning whereby you're not having to slip and slide around on the stick and do all these funny things. I had a guy who actually teaches out at the collective uh, as a bass guy, Hilliard Green, who I worked with uh, a number of times down in Argentina for some jazz camp slash jazz festival stuff. And we were playing, and he noted something about, you know, wow, you're playing really light. And he said, do you ever go up and play like really up on the high end of the stick to play light? And at first I was saying, I would thought, never. But I realized why guys want to do that. But if you understand the dynamic of this, the, you know, what you're doing with the stick, touch is always a factor of development that you want to work on. That shouldn't have to compromise your positioning on the stick to do something radically different. And I would feel drastically uncomfortable, but I've learned through years and years of jazz experience of how to play light and right, as Freddie would say, and keep that, that level dynamically with density. In other words, not losing the edge of what you're doing and being able to keep it up there and keep it to a nice volume where people could have a conversation. Although they shouldn't be when we're playing. They should be listening, right? That's <laughs> right. <laughs> but they do. That's and, right. And the waiters take orders, and the, yeah. bar and the bartenders spill drinks and drop That's glasses right. by the bar. And yeah. <laughs> That's great, Bruce. I really love this stuff. It's really wonderful uh, information that you're giving us. Yeah. So, um, let, let's talking, talk about what, you know, I, I want to get to what you, now, what did you add to what Freddie gave you? I mean, so you've been doing this on your own for a while. Yeah, many, many years. And you must, you must have affected it in some way from your own personality. What did I add? Clarity. Yes. There <laughs> Clarity. you go. <laughs> Clarity of the narrative to bring it forward. Some, um, you know, when you go in, and you would know this as a teacher, I mean, your students are teaching you to a degree. If you, if you hit a bump in the road, you need to solve something. I'm very much of a problem solver and looking at uh, different elements so that I have a very, what do you would say, a program that I would start with. But if I have some issue that, that pops up with a student, I have developed several solutions to those problems depending on the issue that the guy has. So if, if he's not getting it from this angle, I'm able to go, well, let's try this angle and let's try this angle. And I have learned over many years, some people are very visual, some people are very structured and intellectual, you know, mm -hmm. and some people are all in their head or in their ears, you know. And so you got to just kind of weed around, but I, now it's, it's not that I have to uh, fish around for an idea. I'm usually inspired by, oh, wait a minute, I see this guy's not getting it, let's hit it from here. So what did I add? Some things of just understanding, you know, a better understanding of the pivot, uh, modifying some of the roots of uh, what Jimmy Chapin talked about, the molar technique. I know there's a lot of people talking molar, 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 molar. Well, we just had a big thread on that. Started well, by Bill Bachman. That was great. Yeah, and great so you discussion. know, Moeller. If you just say what it is, Sanford Moeller. All he did was observe the whipping and snapping motion, the perpetual motion, the locomotive motion that you tap into that we want to understand dynamically for movement of the stick. So you know, some of those presentations of all this are absolutely <laughs> in my discussions with with a guy like Don Lombardi. We both ascertain that perhaps because of the positioning of the parade drum is why you would come out like that to make that motion because you got the parade drum angled here, so it makes mm -hmm. sense. When you flatten the surface, it's a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. But so, suffice it to say, my modification to that is ball and socket, hinge, hinge. Now, the nitty gritty of the placement inside the hand, that's, a, that's, a, that's something that I can't just narrate in seven seconds and say like, it's this because 
first let me finish the molar and then I'll talk about the inside of the hand. Okay, so yeah. if I just let everything go, there's a natural follow through. It's the good old whipping motion. So the stick has to naturally have a follow through. That means, going back to my statement, letting go is counterintuitive for drummers. A lot of guys, because they're holding the stick, they don't want to let go. They want to bring the stick down and snap it. If you just toss your wrist up and it's loose, if you pumped yourself full of propofol and went whoop, that would just, that would happen, you know? Just, where, can I, where can I get some propofol? Yeah, well, Michael Jackson's not around anymore. So uh, all right. doc, what, what happened to his doctor, Mr. Mur Dr. Murray or whatever? Okay. So you got, you know, this mo locomotive motion to set up some perpetual motion of movement of the stick. Now, the key though, is how you're housing the inside. So you can get the density of stroke, get the evenness of bounces, and that requires like the setup. So in German, I would say that you have compartmentalizing your hand to this part of the hand, this part of the hand, and the middle finger. And they can all work together. You rarely would you let go of the index finger to let the stick go, although some guys do. So, But I'm not worried about what other guys do. I'm worried about what my guys do to tie in to a connectivity from all those different angles of the grip so you're not having to shift reposition do something a little bit different it all just kind of blends in nicely without changing anything i, but I, that, call, I call it integration yeah yeah okay exactly so you know those things i would just say you know it's like the platform that i started with was well placed and my memory for that was well placed what did I add to it besides clarity, a few little nuts and bolts of understanding the dynamic of teaching, was playing. I've been playing for many, many years. My brother and I have a contemporary jazz trio whereby, you know, we made, I don't want to diminish this, but we made real CDs and real records whereby, you know, everybody has a record out now, but we were with MCA Jazz for a couple of records. We were with Mesa Blue Moon for a couple of records. We went to move as a real record industry. Right, and yeah. we did. We went on the road, and we traveled in a van, and I opened up for Billy Cobham. We opened up for the Yellow Jackets, for George, um, yeah. what was his name? Oh, shit. Uh, I can't think of his name. Uh, great uh, alto, I mean, uh, uh, soprano guy, George Howard who passed away, I don't remember what he had, but he died kind of abruptly at a young age. Um, who else? Uh, the Rippington, Spira Gyra, you know, millions of guys. We used to partner up with this group, Uncle Festive, which was at that time a group comprising of the rhythm section of Barry Manilow's group with great drummer Bud Harner, Ron Pedley on piano, John Pondell, and either Mark Levine on bass or Bob Feldman on bass. <laughs> and we'd go on the road, man, we'd play. And then when I was in town, I would do casuals, I would do uh, cover gigs, I would do little jazz gigs, I would do all sorts of playing, sessions, recording sessions with uh, great producer Ken Calais, who produced the Fleetwood Mac stuff, uh, Chet Himes, who was engineering, came out of that Austin scene with Eric Johnson, Joe Ely, um, Stevie Ray Vaughan, got to work with him. So, you know, just tons of, of gigging experience kind of opens your head to kind of evaluate what the hell am I doing <laughs> and how am I doing it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the playing experience has brought me a better narrative to really get uh, across the point to guys because, you know, most of my guys are out there playing and doing stuff. Not every guy, but even the guys that are working on it, they get it and they understand the dynamic of play. You got to play. It's not about just sitting on a pad. It's about getting out and playing. Yeah, you need this to support the calisthenic element of your instrument. It's got to get out there and play. That, that, that's where the real learning begins. Absolutely, because yeah. no matter what you do, it's not a dress rehearsal, man. Mm -hmm. You're yeah. not sitting there and like working. Like, okay, man, if I just get it together, I'll have that gig together. No, you got to go and get your your knee bruised up, and you know, and bump your chin, and fall on your ass, and you know, get some funny looks from the other guys in the band and all that stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. so I'll tell you a funny story where I freaked out. This was a great learning experience, but it's sheer tenacity. I was doing a jazz festival with this great Hammond B3 organist from Germany, Barbara Dennerlein. Uh, if she was, what do I want to say? If she was a little bit more thoughtful, she'd be 
more well known here in the states, but she would always outprice herself to come to the states, you know. Uh, yeah. And uh, I think she did a couple things in New York through the years, but anyway, she was well known in Germany, and I got the gig through this the owner of Enger Records, the great jazz label out of Munich. And we were doing a festival in Berlin, which was going to be live televised and all this stuff. And she was the featured performer, so we had the stage to get the band together and rehearse and do that stuff. Although I had already done a couple gigs with her. And she had a guitar player flying from Austin, Texas. This guy, um, uh, what was his name? Mitch Watkins. And a great tenor player from Bristol, England, Andy Shepard. And so I'm playing this gig and we're rehearsing. And... Uh, we're going through this one tune that had this transition from 12-8 into, you know, changing that dotted quarter note or dotted eighth note into, like, the new pulse, but double time. So it's like, you know, not mathematically challenging, but every time I hit it, I kept falling on my ass. Like, every time she'd stop and she'd go, no, let's do it again. And it was mm -hmm. like 12 Let's do it again. And I remember the guitar player kind of looking over me and giving me that look over the shoulder like, um. And it was just that I was, you know, having a moment mm -hmm. of a little bit of anxiety, you know, this big opportunity to play and all that kind of stuff. So I was sitting back in, and once I finally got it together, and it was kind of like by the skin of the teeth where you nailed it, and you got through, and she didn't ask you to do it again. So I was like, okay. So I was sitting backstage. And all I could do was just sit in center of my focus, and I just sat and, you know, mentally just worked on that transition to that transition. And we got on, and the cameras were on. Safe, I made it. And it was just one of those things. I could have fallen on my ass, or I could have made it. And I just made the, the connectivity of, here I am in this moment. This is that one of those learning moments. you got to do it, man. There's no, oh, wait a minute, let me go home and practice it. Let me just figure, you know, it was like, there it is. And so that actually, that, that built up a lot of like, okay. Now, you know, it felt good. That was like one of those notches in the belt where you went, okay, I think, you know, that's a good experience to remember when you go into the gig. Yeah, I, I could do I could do this. Yeah, yeah be yeah. present and account for it. I mean, I would, I would have been playing a bunch of gigs, but it was just one of those things where in my uh, contemporary jazz setting, it was with me and my brother. So I was a co-leader. I, I helped arrange stuff. I knew the compositions in and out. So when I went up to play, it was like, it was me. It was my thing. It was like, you know, when Buddy went up and played with his band, that was his yeah. thing. Yeah. This was my thing. So playing with Barbara wasn't necessarily my thing because she had a few different drummers. I actually was, you know... Well, uh, when, you, when, when you work for somebody else, now you're entering the real world. Yeah, you have to leave your world and enter out what's really going on out there. Absolutely, absolutely. So, but but the moral of the story is you got to go out and play. You got to get those experiences and actually play with people and interact. So you learn what's appropriate and also <clears throat> your dialect. Study your idioms of, of music so that you understand what is appropriate, what is not appropriate. You know. Yes. Oh yeah. You need to vote, you need to know what the vocabulary is. You know when to need to wear the uh, tennis shoes and shorts and when to come in the tuxedo. Yeah. Right. You have to know what's appropriate for the particular gig as yeah. well. Not only the music, but for the gig. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, one other thing I'll add to my teaching that I add that, that, that is important for me is, you know, some of the philosophical leanings towards how it is to be a musician in that it's, it's communication. It's working with people. You get in with a band, and people think, oh, I'm going to get in this band, we're going to be famous, it's going to be great. No, you've now <clears throat> entered into a dysfunctional family. Yeah, so you right. have to learn mm -hmm. how to deal with those things and communicate and stay focused, but also know how to you know, work with the compromise of those situations, but stay on track with where you want to bring it. Uh, you need, if it's a group of four, you need four like-minded guys to see a specific goal to a certain degree uh -huh. and maintain some semblance of order. Because in those situations, you know, there's a lot of imploding as you know, you know. Yeah. Well, so, uh, people don't realize that going on the road with, with one or three or whatever it is, it's, you know, you're, it's like getting married. Oh, man. <laughs> I, told, I told the bass player that I was working with, and, and he worked with us for about three years. He lives in New York now. He's a great guy. He's a good buddy of mine. I, I love him like a brother, and when he comes out, I love to get a chance to hang with him. We don't get to hang so often. But he, um, he got the opportunity to go on the road with Maynard Ferguson. And I was telling him, because he was like, you know, 
sometimes diminishing what is experienced with what we were doing. Cause we were in a van and we were doing our thing on our own and stuff like that. And I said, dude, you're going to get on a van with this or get in a bus with this guy. And you're going to have like some guy's smelly socks right in your face, you know? And so I laid out this whole kind of scenario. <laughs> and, and, and when he came back to me, like a few months later, he goes, man, you were right. You know, <laughs> that's what it is. People don't understand that side of that. You know, that's right. There's yeah. A whole, other game outside of the practice getting things together that maybe not enough people know about as they're pursuing that older guys who have done it will certainly you know be able to sit back and laugh well, and go, well this is how it works boys well here's the key to getting work and it's very simple you know for every gig there's, a, there's at least 10 people that can do it yeah 20 people 100 people the guy who gets the gig is the is the guy that everybody wants to be with that's it <laughs> That's it. Yeah. It's all about the hang, man. Yep. Yep. So. so this is great. I'm glad you brought up this topic that you went into Europe. Because I, because I, I have a, um, an interest in, in, in understanding uh, what it was like for an American musician yeah. who grew up in America and was str struggling to be a working musician in America to make that move. You did it for a few years and you lived over there. Yeah, what, I actually. What was, uh, what, was, what was that like to try to be? I mean, what did you see that was different for you? What was, what was your response to that? Well, okay. So quickly, as a as a young boy, and it's a long story, but I'll make it real short, the Reader Digest version. But my mother was born in Indonesia, but she's Dutch. She's a Dutch citizen, and my grandfather was from the Netherlands. Indonesia was a Dutch ruled colony, and back in 1917, he took the Trans Siberia train and went to work on the plantations in Indonesia. And lo and behold, he uh, went back on, for, you know, like kind of like a leave of absence and would go to V-Spot in Germany, who met my grandmother, who was to become his wife. They married through proxy. They went to, back to Indonesia. My mother was born there. In 1941, she was thrown in prisoner of war camp with the Japanese. Four years, went back to the Netherlands, had no roots in the Netherlands, and got there in the middle of December where it's, you know, just colder than cold and mm -hmm. probably had some traumatic experiences. I mean, she talks a little bit about it. She's going to be 87, but, you know, some of it she's buried and not talked about. But anyway, so I have European roots. She met my dad who was in the service and he was on leave of absence from Germany where he was stationed during the Korean conflict, went to Amsterdam, met my mom. They, you know, fell in love, blah, 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 and they got married and moved to the States. So my dad later on got a job with KLM, which was a Dutch airline, just ironically. I don't remember if my mom knew somebody or how that worked out, but because of that and my mom's family roots in Germany and Holland, we would go back and travel since since I was two. When, my, when I turned two, that was my dad's rule. When you hit two, you travel. <laughs> and we traveled for, I don't know, I think I made 11 trips by the time I was 13 to Europe. So, and they were four week trips. My dad would take us out of school in October and we would go there and we'd have all this schoolwork. And I remember never, ever really doing my schoolwork mm -hmm. and just hanging and sort of being indoctrinated into these different cultures. So the Netherlands, Germany, Austria were some of the three main countries, but I was in the UK, I was in Belgium, I was in Italy, France, yeah. uh, Yugoslavia, um, Denmark. Uh, I don't remember if we ever made it up to Sweden or Norway, but anyway, so as a kid, you take it for granted. But later on, when I was, you know, in my teens and like 1920, and my brother went off to go to MI at 18, when he finished that one year program, the GIT program, he would go and travel. He would take advantage of my dad being able to get him uh, a standby flight. And he would go bring his guitar and play with people and meet Matthias Winkleman from Enger Records and um, travel and travel. And I'd start to get like kind of itchy about it, go like, geez, what do you, you know, I, I want to go. I want to go. So he booked us a tour in 84 and we went for about six or seven weeks. We had about nine gigs. We made it a little bit of a trip. This is a time when the dollar was extremely high against the German mark. So mm -hmm. our dollars went really far. We bought a van and uh, imported it, that's a whole other story, and worked across the country doing a bunch of colleges, made my home in Nazareth, PA for a little bit with Chris Martin of Martin Guitars, CF the Fourth, and played, played, played. That actually led us to get our deal uh, with MCA. 
So we're doing all these gigs. We've been traveling. We did four records, and we really hadn't gone back to Europe to play. And I was like, I want to go back to Europe and play. And so at one point, driving through the middle of, ah, it could have been New Mexico or Arizona, at about <coughs> one in the morning, our guitar slash sound guy was asleep. Our bass player was asleep. Listening to late night AM radio, I looked at my brother and I went, we got to go to Europe. Hmm. And that was it. That was the end of 1991. And we went, 92. And I remember when I made that declaration to a bunch of my friends, we, we originally stated we would go around February. Well, February turned into May. But hmm. I'd have my friends like, ah, I thought you were going to Europe, man. I thought you were going to Europe. <laughs> but I had everything planned. It's just, you know, sometimes it takes a little longer, but it was a few months. Went over there, and by just sheer tenacity, we made it happen. You know, I met a bunch of different musicians. Uh, very quickly, I met a great bass player who's from Brussels, who worked with my brother and I when we went to Russia, and uh, hmm. did some uh, one of our records with us uh, in 1994, I think it was, 93, 94, and um, gave me an opportunity to teach in Vienna. Blah, blah, blah. So what's my assessment? The assessment was being an American in, in that world, I was in Antwerp, Belgium. So, you know, culturally, each country and actually each city and area of each country has its own little nuances. You wouldn't know that sometimes as an American. So, you know, dialect, I hear different dialects of Flemish as I lived in Antwerp, Belgium for many years. I hear all the different dialects of the Netherlands pretty clearly. A lot of dialects from Germany. Austria and those little nuances were interesting and kind of you know mind opening but when you're in somebody else's backyard and you're from another place they're always looking at you funny what are you what are you doing here Mr. Becker you know well you want to work huh okay so you know some guys were ingratiating to the experience wanting to play with you and some guys were looking at you as hey man this is a small backyard. There's not room for another drummer. <laughs> right, yeah. But I'll tell you, you were asking me yesterday when we were kind of setting this up as the positioning of jazz. Like anywhere else, if you were to talk to the myriad of jazz musicians in the Netherlands or Germany, Italy, they would all say have the same complaints that, you know, the opportunity to play live music is somewhat diminished. Um, you know, I think just the nature of technology has made people more fickle and not as into going out. Now, that's always relative to where we are, you know. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing that I, I noticed most is that, you know, you have some awesome musicians over in Italy. I'm drummers that I've taught because I went over to Italy probably a dozen times between 2006 and 2012 to do workshops with Tony Arco, who's the guy that got me over there is a great drummer. And I mentored Tony to kind of open his head up to a lot of the teaching philosophies that I use. But he's no slouch. He studied with uh, Gary uh, Chafee, Bob Moses, and uh, Mr. Dawson, Mr. Alan Dawson. So he kind of had good fundamental roots in his studies. But the, the, stu the um, conservatories, over, conservatories in the Netherlands were first class, man. There's some great players. They really understand the idiom, the nuance of jazz. I mean, there's great players. So, but, but in terms of the playing and the context of that stuff, it's hard to say, man, because I hear the same complaints from those guys. Eh, there's not a lot of work, you know. Nobody wants to play or this club closed down, you know. So things are bad all over. I guess, you know, I don't want to say it's bad because there's always those few guys that are working. So, well, let's the, build up the, that, that the, industry has, the industry has shrunk, let's yes, say. Yes, yes. But, you know, try to become one of those few dudes that are just working, you know? Yeah, but they definitely that's left opportunities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's there are more opportunities in that you can be a little bit more on top of your own destiny because of the nature of the internet. There are many lanes and you just need to find your lane. Well, you have, uh, to, take, you have to take more responsibility for it yourself. You yes. Know? Oh, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's a big responsibility. So it really shows you, do you really want to do this? I mean, for me, yeah. I had no other choice. <laughs> I, I, I say this and I say this uh, with a little bit of a smirk and a grin, but it's somewhat serious too. I should either be dead or in jail. And these things oh. save my life. Uh -huh. Holy Matt Bruce, you just described my life. Yeah. 
No, Thank serious. You. Like, I could have gone. I'm serious, too. I could have veered off. I mean, I did stupid shit, as they say. But and I'm, I'm still doing stupid, stupid shit. Well, you know, but it's, <laughs> but it's, it's refined shit now. Right. right. It's much more clever. That's right. <laughs> Well, listen, this has been absolutely fantastic. We're, we're getting close to an hour at this okay. point. Okay, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd love to do six hours with you. I mean, you, you've got so much experience to, to give to us, and you're such, such a delight to talk to. You're such a great person. Thank you, Alan. And, and personality. I mean, I really enjoy spending time with you. I appreciate you offering me to sit in on your forum, and uh, this is a great format for connecting with drummers and educators all over the planet to, you know, tell their individual stories or get a perspective into other people, what they're doing, or share what they're doing. It's just a, a wonderful opportunity, and we need no, more of this. We need less entucation, or as I call it, edutainment. <laughs> we, need real yeah, we need real education. It's right, not, really right. no, it's, because there's right. a lot of entertainment that goes on under the guise of education, but it's, you know, it's yeah, not. The, the word clinic has been really uh, uh, Still, fu yeah. very, very fuzzy word now. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't really mean what it used to mean. No, no, no. Yeah. Roy, Roy Burns should be pulling out his hair. Yes, that's exactly where I was going. Thank you very much, Bruce. And I think we better leave before we both get into trouble now. All right. <laughs> So thank you very much for appearing, and thank you for your very kind statements. And uh, and let's continue to do this in the future. I'm sure there'll be many other times we can we can uh, possibly get together or work in some way. Yep. And help each other. And do Love to. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. It. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you all for watching. And I'm going to remind you again, as I always do at the end of every program, to please practice. Just keep practicing, because that's really what you need to do. And get a good teacher, a real teacher. Bye bye. Yeah.